Today's sermon scripture is taken out of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. <coughs> where it reads, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have, the, have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put in effect when the, thing, when the times reach their fulfill, fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him... We are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. May God have blessing on his holy word. Have y'all ever heard the story of the woman who was in Iceland on a vacation that spent half of her time trying to find herself. And this literally happened. She was literally looking for herself. See, her tour bus that was uh, taking her on this vacation stopped in a volcanic region in Iceland. And so while she had the opportunity, she went into the rest area, and she changed her dress, and she freshened up. Well, the tour guide miscounted because she had changed. He miscounted the people on the bus. And so a search begun. And the description of the woman that they were looking for was an Asian woman, about five foot three, in dark clothing, speaking English well. And the woman had joined about 50 other people in this search party until about 3 a.m. when she actually realized that she was the woman everyone was searching for. Because she did not recognize herself in the description that was set out. And today I want us to look at how God describes us. Because we might hardly recognize his description of us. And it begins in the very first verse of Ephesians, when he calls us holy people. See, although the NIV says in Ephesus, some early manuscripts do not have in Ephesus. So we can assume that Paul was addressing all believers because we are holy people. Not because we are especially good, but because God has set us apart for his special people. God's description might surprise us. It might challenge us. It may even encourage us. But I want it to 
say, yes, I want to be like that. Like God says, I can. See, in Ephesus, we can discover not only how God sees us, but also how God helps us to become the people, the holy people that he, he meant for us to be. Question. Before the beginning of time, God decided to create the universe, correct? Why did he do that? Why do people create it all? Because when people create something, something wonderful happens. Their abilities, their thoughts, their uniqueness is displayed in their creation. They create, when they create art or music or build things, cook things, write stories, others say, I had no idea that they had that in them, that they were capable of doing such. They may even say that their hidden glory shines through what they create. There's another purpose to creation, which, however, displays a more glorious aspect of humanity. People have children not only to generate new life, but to express the love which is inside of them. A love of a parent may be hidden until a child is born. And a parent can actually display the depth of their love through parenthood. See, it's not very unusual for people or friends to say, I see a different side of this person when they're with their children or when they're with their child. This isn't the same person I once knew. Some people create <clears throat> to see what they can get out of it as well, to fill a void of recognition of love. God doesn't do that. His glory is great, and it's great enough, and it's magnificently displayed in heaven. Yet God created the universe and the people in it. He did it to demonstrate his glory in a new dimension, to share his glory with people like you and me. Even atheists ask the question, why does the universe exist? The answer is found in Psalm 19, verse 1. It says, the, heaven, the heavens declare the glory of God. That is the immensity of the universe with its finely tuned structure points to the God who is beyond human comprehension. Yet when God created the universe, it was still, as Genesis 1 says, formless and empty. God already had a special purpose in mind. The universe would bring forth life, and human beings would live on a planet known as Earth. God created people for his glory. In Isaiah 43, God says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Humans display the glory of God's creative activity. And they're glorious. All any, any of us have to do is look in the mirror. We can look at ourselves, see the amazing body and mind God gave us. But God has also given us creativity and spiritual awareness. We have love, compassion, faithfulness, commitment to others that reflect the glory of God. And even more glorious, we as humans among all the animals on earth have the ability Ability to know and worship the God who made us. 
That is, we can give God the glory. Yet not everything about humanity displays the glory of God. Because there is a lot of ugliness in the world. In fact, this world is quite evil. Technology can destroy. Art degrade. And people can be cruel. And too often, the glory of God is not evident in human life. We read about it in Genesis from the sin and the fall and how humans chose to rebel against God. The essence of the sin of Adam and Eve was to live not for the glory of God, but for their own glory. Satan tempted Eve, saying, you will become like gods, knowing good and evil. When they sought their own glory, they were no longer bringing glory to God. And they failed in the purpose for which they were created. And as the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 29, he says, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served and created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depraviety. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. And although humanity failed to fully display his glory, God did not give up on his plan for creation. That's why Paul said in verses 9 and 10, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth in Christ. In other words, God's glorious plan is that everything will come together with Christ ruling over all things to the glory of God. If we look at the world today, we recognize that not everyone accepts Christ as ruler over all creation. In fact, we struggle to submit to the one who has made us to live in his perfect kingdom of righteousness. Because how could we, as sinners, be included in this perfect reign of Christ? And there's an answer. Paul tells us in verses 11 and 12. He said, in him we were chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who, wo who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. That is, God chooses people to be included in his plan to redeem all of creation. He chooses them for specific purposes. Paul says three times in this chapter that God chooses people for the praise of his glory. So how does God choose people to be included in his plan of redemption? Does he choose people that are perfect for what he wants to accomplish? No. He chooses people who are not perfect yet. Look at what verses 7 and 8 say. 
says in him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. God chooses people who need forgiveness, who need grace, who need to be redeemed from their slavery to sin. The Bible is quite clear that God does not choose people who are smarter or better or more spiritual than others. He does not even choose people because of the potential that he sees in them. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26b through 31, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. How then does God choose people to be saved? To live in obedience to Christ and to glorify God. That is a mystery which is impossible for us as humans to comprehend. It is a marvelous mystery, however, for it says that God had already had us in his mind when he created the universe. Verses 4 through 6 say, For he chose us in him for the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption into sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of the glorious grace, which he has freely given us and the one he loves. I know a lot of people have a hard time accepting predestination. Some say that if God predestined us to be adopted as his children, we don't really have any choice in the matter. They say that predestination and free will cannot both be true. But I say that God does not agree. Because look at verse 13, what it says. He said, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Paul implies that we do have a choice to believe in the good news of salvation. Paul is saying also that God chooses us. We also have to choose to believe. Even our choice to believe, though, needs God's help. God sent his son to save us. God arranged for us to hear the good news. And God sends his Holy Spirit to guide us, both before and after we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Yet it we must still believe and accept that gift of salvation. The relationship between predestination and free will is a mystery, one which we cannot comprehend, nor do we need to fully. When Paul reflected on the mystery of election, in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 34, when he said, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, 
how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor. And yet we still do not understand everything about election. To get the drift of what Paul is saying, we don't have to. There are two things that are true. That is, God chose us before we had a chance to deserve anything. And we must choose to receive his salvation and glorify him. So how do we know? How do we know whether God has chosen us? Is it a matter of intellectual understanding? Or spiritual sensitivity? Can we walk into a grocery store and pick out our brothers and sisters because of a mark on their forehead? No. We are chosen by God. The fact that we are merely here today in his house of worship means that we have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're here to bring him glory. So if you want to be one of God's people, Paul puts it clearly at the choice that you should make. He said, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. So the gospel of salvation is that the Son of God, who became man to restore humanity to its intended place in God's plan, lived as a man, died for the sins of humanity, and overcame the power of evil by rising from the dead. He ascended into heaven, therefore confirming God's plan. <coughs> To bring all things in heaven and earth together under one head, Jesus Christ. And if we believe that to be true, and we trust in God to make it real for us, we're choosing to be part of God's glorious plan. It's as simple as that. In addition, if you believe the good news of the gospel, God will give you an amazing gift. The gift of himself in the form of the Holy Spirit. When Peter preached at Pentecost, he gave an invitation to accept the good news. In Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 39, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord, our God, will call. The evidence of being chosen by God is twofold. Our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the seal of the Holy Spirit we make a decision to trust Christ. And God begins to transform us through his Holy Spirit. And Paul says something wonderful about how the Holy Spirit relates to us when we live by our faith. He doesn't say that we get a mark on our forehead or a certificate to prove that we belong to Christ. The Holy Spirit begins to transform us into the perfect people that we will be someday. We begin to break the power of sin in obedience to Christ. We begin to 
leave behind things that don't satisfy. And we taste the fruit of the Spirit. That is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We rejoice in every opportunity to glorify God by how we live. In Christ, we are chosen to bring glory to God. The entire universe declares the glory of God. But God's chosen people have the greatest role in fulfilling the purpose of creation. The glory of God. That gives meaning and purpose to every aspect of our lives, big or small. Because when we roll out of the beds in the morning and we think about our days, we should pray for opportunities to bring glory to God. As we drive to work, we should think about how we can display the glory of God. When we hang out with friends and family, we need to try to love them as God loves them. When we worship, our focus is not on what we gain from our worship, but how we glorify God. When we sit alone, when no one is watching except for God and the angels, we need to bring every thought into submission to Jesus Christ. Every life matters, and God has chosen you to be included among those who most fully display his glory. Some may be older and losing their abilities, but the glory of God still shines in them. There may be those struggling and fail often, and yet God will not let go. His glory shines through in the struggles. You may have a life full of potential, but make sure that God's glory shines, not yours. See, God has chosen us to be forgiven, redeemed from the power of sin, and adopted as his child. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is transforming each and every one of us, publicly and privately, through our characters, through our relationships, through our capabilities and our abilities. And this is happening in each and every one of us. And it will continue to happen. To the praise of God's glory. Amen.